You're listening to the Practical Tax Podcast with tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. The information contained in this podcast is based upon information available as of date of recording and will not be updated for any changes in law or regulation. Any information is not to be considered tax advice or legal advice and does not form an attorney-client relationship. Further, this podcast may be construed as attorney advertising. You should seek professional consultation for your individual tax and legal situation. Welcome to another edition of Practical Tax with tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. Let's start with a guest that's kind of in your backyard. Uh, That would be Michael Davidson. Not only a, a really smart investor, but he has a lot of ideas and he's nice enough to join us here. Let's, can we talk about uh, wills and trusts for just a second here? Because this confuses a lot of people. Steve, how many people do you think watching this right now don't have a will or a trust? A lot of them don't have anything. And another thing is there's a lot of people that have something that's woefully out of date. And if they don't change it, they're leaving everything they have to someone that they now hate and they will turn over in their graves if they, they understand that. So this is something like should always be constantly reviewed. What I tell income tax clients is, look, you know, we think about your income taxes all year long. We plan all year long. We file a return once a year and your estate planning, which involves everything you've worked for in a lifetime everything that you have, whether you got yourself or somebody left with you, why don't you give that the time and respect it deserves? Michael, what's your experience? I mean, do you, have you found that when you try to sell somebody on, on getting a trust or a will together, um, it depends on their age, are they stubborn or they, you, they usually go right along with your suggestion? <clears throat> you know, I think one of the questions that isn't expressed out loud or, or asked out loud is is the next steward prepared and i think for a lot of us and for a lot of our clients there's some uncertainty around that and that's even a a conversation that uh, couples haven't really processed together and so as a result there is this inaction that takes place as it relates to getting a will done getting a trust done Um, and there's you know all of us have stuff in our families and kids and grandkids and daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws and just that whole dynamic uh, adds this element of uncertainty for the future. And I just think that is a tough, it's tough for couples to come together and, and be decisive with that. And so I really think that the, that the good question to ask is, is the next two are prepared? If they're not, then what needs to happen to get there? And I think walking through that, that series of questioning, I think can help get an estate plan done. Obviously, there are going to be different stages of life. Uh, I know both you guys can address this. I mean, people start thinking about some of these things when they get to be 50, and it's kind of too late in in some cases for financial planning. Um, But, you know, a a trust and a will, uh, those have to be constantly reviewed. Uh, But but why? And Steve, let me ask you real quick. What what is it about a will that would change or a trust that would change from when the kid is 25 to when the kid is 35, if it's still just my money that I'm passing along? Laws change, taxes change, wants change, relationships change. For example, what if you have a situation where your son marries or divorces, has a child, has six kids, one of them has special needs, somebody's developing differently than somebody else. Somebody has a problem, they have an addiction or something else it's like life well why you know if you had um, anything in life life is a constant series of changes and a lot of people go through life and and they wish or they they think well something's in stone it's not that's just the way life is this is constantly needs reviewing well michael let me ask you something about when when you set up administrators uh for trust um if they're this again this is it might sound really ignorant here, but it occurred to me that if you set up the administrator and it's the same age as, for example, myself, by the time the trust needs to be administered, they might be as old as I am. Do you change administrators along the way? Well, uh, generally, we, uh, we're advisors in uh, money managers, and so we have uh, estate planning attorneys that help us with that. And they're thoughtful enough to ask that question, is this person really ready to do that? And um, obviously, uh, any good estate plan is going to have successor administrators um, and trustees and executors. Exactly. So I think that's um, that's a part of the process. But and that's another question that a great attorney asks: Is, is this person have the competency and the ability 
to administer your estate. What about uh, tax laws? You mentioned tax laws change. Do are some of these grandfathered in? Like if I start a trust and a will uh, based on the assumption that the way the law is now and the law changes, uh, do some states or the feds, do they grandfather that old law in into your plan? When uh, I'm going to quote what I quoted back when I was a law professor, law is only that which those in power at the time say it is. Our Congress in their infinite wisdom can do whatever they want to do. And there, there's so many times when they're even thinking about something, you have to be prepared and saying, well, for example, right now, there's a very generous exemption from estate taxes. What if that changes? Well, you have to be prepared for it. And the reason we'd like to tell our clients about it is you don't want to get a call from your lawyer saying, hey, there's a new law coming in at midnight tonight. Do you want to make a major change? Hurry up and tell me because we have three hours. Yeah. These are things that you want to think about, plan, and then say, well, if this happens, I'm going to go this way. If that happens, I'm going to go that way. I like the name of your, your company, Michael, Wealth Wisdom. Um, and uh, the wisdom part, I think, is, is really important, especially as, you know, we get if people, you know, get into their 60s and they start thinking about retirement. And now we have this incredible inflation that's going to eat at least hopefully short for a short period of time into people's um, uh, pensions and, and 401ks and, and, and savings. Um, or as we like to call it, turn them into 201k plans. <laughs> well, let me, here's my question for you. If you are going to go back to work, and we had a discussion about that a few episodes back on practical tax. If you're going to go back to work, is it better to go into something where you can file a long form to help abate some of those taxes? This is a question for both of you, but I'll start with you, Michael. Well, I, I think, um, going back to work whether you're currently working or not going back to work you uh, you always we call it walking in wisdom and um, another way to say that is just being you know we want to be healthy one of the best ways that i can have uh, longevity in the future is to be is to do my best to be healthy today and it's the same way with finances and with uh, finances there's really uh, five things you can get, do with money you can give it away you can save it for the future you can pay taxes uh, you can pay down debts quickly or you can spend it. And as it relates to um, a tax planning, um, our recommendation to our clients is to do the giving and the saving first. Uh, that generally helps with lowering taxes. And um, if you can do that and live on a, the, uh, develop a lifestyle that allows for giving and saving when you have income in the future, um, you're more likely to have a lifestyle that, that works. And so it isn't necessarily a, a tail wagging the dog. We want the, <laughs> the dog to, we want the dog to wag the tail here. Yeah. And Love Chip, that a stuff. lot of times you, you can put those together where you do have a charitable interest, but the charitable interest will throw off an income tax benefit. For example, if you do a CRT, charitable remainder trust, and you say that you want to live in this house for the rest of your life and your spouse for the rest of their lives. But when the second of you passes, your house is going to go to the charity of your choice. You get an income tax deduction for that now. And physically, everything is the same. You're living in the house the rest of your life and your spouse's life. But you pay less taxes now because of something that's going to happen after you've passed. Yeah, and amazing stuff. Uh, can we get you back, Michael? I really appreciate it. I was it, We had a hard time tracking each other down, but I really appreciate you being here. Thank you no, so anytime. much. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, his website will be at the end of the show, but it's called thewisdomindex.com. Uh, and um, I could use some wisdom. I could use some more wisdom. We I, all can always use more wisdom. If, if Only was, watch out for the guy who says he doesn't need any because he knows all there the you go. Now. Right. That's the guy I want to avoid. having nothing to do with pepper, state and local taxes. Here in California, California does follow a lot of the federal law, but not all of it. There's some laws that are just different in California. And other laws, the state will interpret more strictly. For example, with 1031 exchanges, the state interprets things more strictly. Also, California enacted what's called a clawback rule, where if you exchange a property for a property in a state outside of California, there's special reporting rules.
Then we have situations where lots of people move in and out. Moving in is easy. They say, okay, you're taxable. Moving out, which a lot of people are doing, the state of California may still try to tax you. This comes up all the time in our practice. So what happens is whether a state can tax you or not depends on two things. One's the residency. That's easy, physically. Right now, today, we're in San Francisco, California. But suppose you move to another state, say Texas, that doesn't have a state income tax. California may still try to tax you on your worldwide income, saying that although you're not physically present in California, you intend someday to return to California as your permanent home. Even though you're physically in Texas, California may say that you have to pay California taxes on your worldwide income because you're a domiciliary of California. So when people are considering leaving California, we like to meet with them and what we call cut all the strings. The best thing you could ever have is never come back here again. But would a, would a day in Disneyland get you taxed? If there was nothing else, probably not. But certainly you don't want to have a California driver's license. You want to have the driver's license for where you live and your registration. And, and your doctors and dentists, because if you, you say, well, I have this great doctor in California, California says, see? And that's one of the factors. And another factor I think is extremely unfair. They ask if you have family in California. Now, when you have adult family, your mother can live wherever she pleases. And if your mom decides she wants to live in California, you've moved to Texas, the state actually will go ahead and consider that as a, as a factor. Now, sometimes the state has been so outrageous, there was a big case in Los Angeles where the state judge found the actions of the state of California so unreasonable, the judge said it's so clear that the taxpayer moved to another state, it was Nevada in that case, that the judge ordered the state of California to reimburse the attorney fees. And the bottom line is that's one of the things we have to watch out for. So I was thinking about this about 15, 16, 17 years ago, nobody, nobody would have been able to predict the growth and success of Amazon, uh, much less, you know, e-commerce and all that. But there's obviously a dark side to all that. Um, uh, Stephen Pope is our guest. He's the founder of uh, myamazonguy.com and has some, I think, some valuable insights into uh, this, this whole world. Stephen, I've seen your videos. Hey. Great stuff. Thank yeah. you for being with us on Practical Tax. Well, thanks for having me, Chip. Um, Steve, you shop on Amazon. I shop on Amazon. Um, and I remember when Walmart would come to small communities and the small businesses would all complain. And I remember not being so um, understanding, thinking to myself, well, you know, some businesses can sit right next to uh, a Walmart and do well, like one of those little yogurt places. I, I remember reading a story about some of the places kind of like, you know, you have this big shark and you see the little, little fish is just kind of hang around the shark and eat the remains of what he eats. But Amazon is, is different than Walmart and different than a, a shark. Stephen, how is it different and, and how is it affecting our lives? And is it all good or is it a, a little bit of both? Well, I definitely buy a lot of stuff on Amazon. All I know is God bless the trash man that takes away all those brown boxes right. because it's become a part of our life. I mean, Amazon is half the economy and not because Amazon themselves make half of the GDP, but because of all of the impacts that are integrated. If we talk about logistics, supply chain and everything that's involved and, and all of the e-commerce that grew lots from the pandemic and now we're seeing a downturn on it. But the consumer has basically trusted Amazon more in the United States um, to shop on that platform than any other platform in the country. And more than 60% of all product searches start on Amazon. That They passed Google a couple of years ago. So it's a massive platform with a massive impact. And we're, we're seeing uh, Amazon accelerate in many ways. Steve, um, obviously, when you start a new business, most of us think of, you know, renting office space and, and you know, you know, putting a sign out, getting an ad, coupons, all that. Um, there are a lot of businesses that actually are, are part of the Amazon world and, and their material goes up on there. Um, does that offer a long term problem uh, for the government for collecting taxes that uh, because now they don't have you know, again, local taxes are, are going to go down because people are doing it from their home. Are they going to, is Amazon going to change 
the tax structure on a local level and then maybe one day on a federal level or has it already begun? It already has because as we see with the sales taxes, it used to be that Amazon said, well, we don't have a brick and mortar store in your jurisdiction, so no sales tax for you. And uh, they got sued and, and now you see there's sales taxes. And, and, and basically what happens wherever there's a government, somebody's looking to say, how can they get some more taxes? <laughs> God bless the government and taxes, right? Uh, and, you know, I, you know, and Amazon is getting into more and more stuff. You know, now Amazon will drop groceries at your door yeah. within two hours. And then the pharmaceuticals they're just getting into. So who knows what else Jeff Bezos will say, hey, I think they should be part of the team. Stephen, I saw one of your videos and you were really upset at Amazon for having this discount day, the second uh, <laughs> prime day. Explain why you were upset and how that affects businesses that advertise on Amazon. It's going to diminish the value uh, and, and it's actually going to hurt sales because now consumers, you're just going to hold on and they're going to wait for the perceived discount in sales. And quite frankly, most of the sales that happen on prime day are you know, I mean, like this year's sales for the July Prime Day were basically last year's regular prices. I mean, it's it's just become such a, a ra race to increase pricing with margins being so low and inflation so high. Your cost of personnel, your cost of cogs, the supply chain's a wreck. Uh, and, you know, you're lucky if you even have stuff in stock in many instances. Um, you know, a, a minute ago, you mentioned uh, the cost of opening a business, right? So my business, I have 330 employees worldwide and not a single one of them in a building completely remote and so when we talk about amazon businesses wow. yeah I'm a, I'm a big a culture guy I hire a lot and when we talk about amazon businesses they are not opening up brick and mortar shops these small businesses are digital shops leveraging an infrastructure that is run through multiple networks and because of amazon and fba fulfilled by amazon these brands and businesses weren't put out of business like they were in the Walmart days that you talked about, but instead they were actually, um, quite frankly, able to be native born Amazon brands. Many of the brands that you guys consume and know, like Goalie is a great example, right? Big supplements brand. They were born on Amazon. Many, many brands that are born on Amazon can then leverage their platform and go to the brick and mortar and, and go through regular distribution, but they don't even need to. Uh, even though if we quiz a thousand people, what was the last thing you bought on Amazon? You get um, all kinds of answers, socks, unicorn meat, you can buy anything on Amazon these <laughs> days, right? But then if you then ask them, okay, what was the name of the brand that you bought it from? If, if more than 2% of people could answer that question, I would be very surprised. So Amazon has commoditized the market and they've made this vehicle where it's two day shipping prime now, like Steve brought up uh, and the ability to access inventory. In and fact, also, it gave the opportunity for a small business to have a worldwide market. Yes. You know, in the old days, if you set up mom and pop store, well, OK, people would walk into the store. But somebody in another city or state or country is certainly not going to. But now it doesn't matter. And you can that's why you've seen an exodus from so many cities when people say, why should I? And the pandemic changed so much where people say, why should I pay all this rent in a, a city that has high cost? high taxes, when I can move someplace else, get a much bigger, nicer property and pay way less money when I'm tapping on my computer all day anyway. I, I know brands that are in Puerto Rico right now because of the tax havens and everything. And they, they're on computer. Oh, shit. The yeah. Acts 20 and 22 in Puerto Rico. Oh, can you save Boku? You got me really excited. You can save <laughs> Boku federal tax. We'll do that in a separate show because we have to go in a few minutes. But I could, I could be talking quite a bit about that. Is, I, um, is, is downtown America and brick and mortar dead? Uh, I think, I think if you'd asked me that question a year and a half ago, I probably would have said yes. Um, today I think the answer is no. Uh, and I think that consumers are going back to the regular habits and they really want to, um, e-commerce had like a decade of growth in eight weeks, but we've actually seen it kind of regress like seven years backwards in the last, uh, three quarters. Um, we're definitely in a depression, not a recession. We're in a depression. And, and, and the economic landscape is terrible. What I think is coming. You know, um, the old you know, the old definition between a recession and a depression, right? When I lose my job, it's a depression. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and that's that's interesting because it's 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 true. But I think in the old days, if you lost your job, you're screwed. But now you have opp opportunities uh, like what you're doing. They I do. mean, so 
I mean, I, I, I hate to say that to people who lost their job. Oh, it's an opportunity. And, you know, because you know what they're thinking. But though that's exactly what happened to me, actually. So I was making $200,000. I thought I was at the top of my game. I was a director. I was a hotshot working in e-commerce for a lighting brand. And I got laid off. They gave me a nice three-month severance package. That was cool. And I was like, you know, most people would go on vacation or do something. Well, I yeah. started an agency in under 48 hours because I got laid off. So I agree with you, Chip. Um, well, opportunities. Failure is very motivating to me. Just talking to you for 10 minutes, I can tell I'd want you on my side. Will you come back with us, please, Stephen? I absolutely would. Thank One you. other thing you might find curious, uh, there's about $10 billion that have entered our space in these things called Amazon aggregators. Uh, and they basically went around and bought all these Amazon brands up. So Thrasio, $2 billion, just that one alone. Uh, they're now crashing and now we're seeing a big uh, market change. But there's just a lot going on in the Amazon space. So we would be happy to, Chip. All right. Well, great. I know um, your uh, email address will be at the end of this so people can get in touch with you if they have any questions. And I, I suggest people watch your videos on YouTube. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank well, you so um, yeah, th that is amazing. St I, that is uh, a subject that I would like to dive deep into the whole, what, what this landscape is going to look like. Again, thanks so much again. That is uh, Steve Moskowitz. This is Practical Tax. The Practical Tax Podcast with tax attorney Steve Moskowitz.